Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% of show about women reshaping our world. Coming up. As the conflict in Sudan grinds on, we're witnessing the sad and inevitable increase in sexual and gender violence against women and girls as millions flee danger. Also, the ongoing struggle for women to be taken seriously and why we lack authority in the minds of so many men. I'll be talking shortly to renowned UK journalist and author Marianne Sighart, who's written a book entitled, appropriately enough, The Authority Gap. Plus, how swimming lessons for girls in the Maldives not only saves lives, but also gives them access to jobs in once inaccessible sectors such as tourism and fishing. But first, and as the conflict in Sudan continues, a massive humanitarian crisis is said to engulf the whole country as its neighbours deal with a rising influx of refugees. Thousands of children are also facing potential starvation and sadly, as it always appears to be the case, sexual and gender-based violence are having an appalling toll on both women and girls. Her newborn on her lap, this Sudanese woman has a brief moment of respite in this refugee camp in Chad. She was forced to flee her home in Darfur after fighting broke out between the Sudanese army and the rival rapid support forces. <laughs> I was still pregnant. I strapped my youngest to my back and held my eldest by the hand. We started walking barefoot in the middle of the night until we finally reached Chad. Over 378,000 Sudanese people, many women and children, have sought refuge in neighboring Chad. They've escaped the shelling, but must now face the threat of hunger. Mothers are facing serious difficulties feeding their children, and we have to deal with numerous cases of malnutrition. To get this far, these families had to evade the RSF, which evolved from the notorious Janjaweed militia, known for its racially motivated atrocities perpetrated in Darfur in the early 2000s. Since the start of the conflict, there's been an uptick in militia attacks in what the UN warns could be a targeted campaign of ethnic cleansing. My wife and children left for Chad before me. The Janjaweed militias attacked them on the way while they were near a river. A bullet struck my wife and broke her leg instantly. Attacks have particularly targeted the Masalit ethnic group. There's growing evidence of widespread sexual violence being perpetrated against women and girls. The UN is sounding the alarm. It's appealing for $1 billion to provide essential aid and protection to all refugees fleeing the conflict in Sudan. Now, this is something most likely all of us as women can relate to. The fact that we are not taken seriously. Either we are belittled, undermined, interrupted or mocked. It so infuriated Marianne Sighart that she wrote a book about it entitled The Authority Gap, why women are still taken less seriously than men and what can we do about it. Marianne is also a well-known English journalist, broadcaster and former assistant editor of The Times and she joins me now from London. Marianne, thank you so much for your time. I rattled off many of your accomplishments because, like so many of us women, it's not often assumed that you bring something to the table, either literally or metaphorically, Marianne. That's so right. So women are twice as likely as men to say that they have to provide evidence of their competence because people assume they're not going to be good until they prove that they are. And nearly twice as likely as men to say that people are often surprised at their abilities. And what we tend to do is to assume that a man knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise, whereas for a woman, it's all too often the other way around. And as a result of that, we do underestimate women. We often patronize them. People interrupt them, talk over them, listen to them less attentively than they do to men. They tend to challenge their expertise much more, and they often resist their authority if women are in a position of authority over them. And this is what I call the authority gap. It's even happened to you, I understand, when you attended a dinner party. Well, yes, it was actually a dinner at a conference and I was sitting next to a fellow delegate, a man, and he asked me what I did. 
And I led a portfolio career. So I said, well, I write a column about politics for The Independent and I make radio programmes for the BBC and I'm on a couple of commercial boards and I chair a think tank. I'm on the Council of Tate Modern, you know, and I ran off, I ran off this list. And he said, oh, you're a busy little girl. I was 50. I was older than the then prime minister. There is no way that he would have called a man of my age a busy little boy. How does society suffer as a result of this constant underestimation of women's capabilities? Well, what happens is that because employers promote women less fast than men because of this constant underestimation, they're actually only using half of the talent pool properly. They are missing out on fantastic talent uh, in the middle and the top of their organisations. And so society actually loses out that way. But actually men lose out too, because if men don't respect women equally, Women really notice and they really dislike it. And believe me, we can tell if a man respects us, listens to us, doesn't underestimate us. We love men like that. And all the academic research shows that both in more egalitarian countries and in more egalitarian relationships in which the man and the woman share the chores and the childcare pretty equally, not only are the women healthier and happier, which you might expect, less resentful, less exhausted, and the children are healthier and happier and they do better at school. They get on much better with their dads. But the men themselves are actually happier and healthier. You might not expect that. They are twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives, nearly half as likely to be depressed, much less likely to get divorced. They tend to smoke less, drink less, sleep better, take fewer drugs. And here's the absolute clincher. They get more frequent and better sex. So, guys, this is really in your interest. And some women, however, do play up to that underestimation, calling it a secret power. But is that just playing into the status quo as opposed to challenging deeply held cultural biases? Yeah, it is, absolutely. It's making the best of a bad job. You know, they think, well, if I can't actually... If I can't rise on merit then I'm just going to have to use other tactics. So it's a way of getting round the authority gap. But, you know, let's actually be straightforward about it and say women are just as intelligent, intelligent as men. We know that. At every academic level, women actually outperform men from kindergarten right through to PhDs. We are just as good as men, and it's time that people treated us that way. So, Marianne, the inevitable question is, what can we do about it? Well, in my last chapter, I counted the other day, I have 140 solutions. Um, and I'm, you'll be pleased to hear there isn't time to go through them all now. But we can all as individuals examine our bias and just notice when it comes to mind and then correct for it. I mean, it's called unconscious for a reason. We don't generally do it on purpose, but we can notice when it manifests itself. You know, we can notice if we're interrupting women more than men or if we're not listening to what a woman has to say in the same way that we would to a man, or if when we walk up to a man and a woman together, we automatically address the man first. We can start correcting for that sort of behavior. We can also affirm what a woman says at a meeting if it's interesting. Men will affirm other men, but they very rarely refer affirm other women. And actually, women aren't very good at affirming other women either. So, you know, if you make a good point, I can say, oh, yeah, I really agree with what Annette said there. That was great. Or if you make a point at a meeting and no one takes any notice until a man repeats it 10 minutes later and suddenly it's treated like the second coming, I can say, oh, I'm so glad you agreed with what Annette said earlier. Or if somebody interrupts you, I can say, hang on, I was really interested in what Annette was saying there. So we can, we can act as allies to other women. And I would really hope that men would do that too. Marianne Sickhout, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Now, mention the country Maldives and people immediately think of a wonderful holiday destination. More than 80% of its 1,100 islands are only a metre above sea level. Yet a significant number of young women don't know how to swim, which means some jobs, such as in the tourism and fishing sectors, are inaccessible. Our team on the ground sent us this report on how swimming lessons offer a lifeline to many women in more ways than one. On the island of Rashtu, most of the women can't swim. This is the first time these women get this deep in the ocean. 
and skull and breathe, yes, continue the kick, continue the kick. Located in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the Maldives is surrounded by water. Yet, only a handful of people can swim, and most of them are men. This realization prompted swimming instructor Amina Zuna to set up the Ocean Women Project in 2019 to encourage women to take up swimming. Women avoid the sea for many reasons, but especially those who wear the hijab. They don't feel comfortable going to the sea and coming home in wet clothes that stick to their bodies. Knowing how to swim in the Maldives can open doors to new opportunities. I'm a school teacher. I take lessons because I like to teach extracurricular activities to my pupils. I'm learning fast by taking part in this program, but I'm still a bit scared of going into deep water. <laughs> Non-swimmers cannot work in the fishing and tourism sectors, the top employers in the country. On the island of Viligili, Zuna Nassim is the first Maldivian woman to lead a diving school. I want to go up. For her, like learning to, to swim is the key to finding a stable job. And economically, uh, I think this is a very good career opportunity for females to start into and to work into it. If you look at the resort, there are a lot of European females working as dive instructors, but it's rare to see a local work in there. So I think this image has to change because this is a profession for both. It's not just for men. Things are gradually changing in the Maldives. Swimming as a tool for survival and for discovering the country's beautiful national heritage. The practice opens the door for Maldivian women to the spectacular underwater world that attracts tens of thousands of tourists from around the globe every year. And that's all for this edition. We'd love to hear your suggestions for the 51%, so do get in touch via Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. And you can catch our previous episodes on our website. So until our next show, bye for now.